morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the final day of the ninth International Festival of Public Health. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you to this um, special session on COVID-19 in India and Nigeria. Um, this session has been set up in memorial of our colleague, Dr. Jana, um, who we sadly lost to COVID-19 earlier this year. Um, Dr. Jana ran one of our partners' organisations in India, DMSC. Um, and today we've invited Dr. Jana's colleague and friend, Dr. Deb Mandel, um, to introduce the work of Dr. Jana and tell us a bit more about his life. Um, so Dr. Mandel, if I can ask you to share your screen. Thank you. Is the screen not shared at the moment? Uh, no, you'll have to share that again for us, Deb, I'm afraid. Okay. That's it. You share now. Yeah, that's great. We can see that. Thank you. Shall I start? Yep, go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk about my friend and colleague, Dr. Sarojit Jana. And good morning to you all, and good, good afternoon to those people who are in a different time zone. Why I was asked to talk about Dr. Jana is because I knew him very well, and he was one of my most close overseas collaborator for various research and education program. Let me get the technical things sorted. And I acknowledge and thank DMSC for providing the most of the presentation materials. It is frozen again. Slides are not moving. Sorry. I'm afraid the slides are frozen. Can anybody help? Maybe. Okay, Deb, if you want to, to stop sharing on yours, then I'll put the slides up on mine. Just so you try once more. Yeah, you, if you give it another go, and I'll get them up on mine as well, just in case. Right, we are back again. Um, so who was Dr. Jana? Dr. Jana can be described as a medical doctor, a public health specialist, an epidemiologist, a researcher and academician, an ardent advocate for the response to HIV and the architect of India's national HIV response for the key populations, a champion of human rights and the dignity of sex workers. And he was also the founder of the Darbar Mohila Samannaya Committee, abbreviated as DMSC, which is a collective of sex workers. He was a winner of national and international honors and accolades, a distinguished voice in domestic and global forums, and much more. He was responsible for collectivization of the women caught between poverty, sex trade, and the scourge of HIV and AIDS. The demand of sex work is work first came 
from the tireless efforts of Dr. Jana. Dr. Jana developed and articulated a new programming concept coined as community-led structural intervention, CLSI, as a unique approach to health interventions. This is based on three main elements. Mobilizing community through strategizing active engagement and collective action of and by the community in establishing their rights and social entitlement as citizens ensuring control over the process and product of the intervention, and building an enabling uh, environment to keep control on and to sustain change and quality of improvement. His brainchild, the Darbar Mohila Samunna Community, DMSC, which is a forum of thousands of sex workers and their children in West Bengal, who fought for the workers' rights of the sex workers of West Bengal and India, besides their sexual health and social dignity. He was an advocate of decriminalizing and legalizing sex work and had most part of his career function from Kolkata. He acted like a father figure of women who live in brothels of West Bengal and other parts of India. His main objectives were to help all marginalized communities with special focus to sex workers so that they can access basic rights and social justice. I think the key word here is all marginalized communities, not just sex workers. To help sex workers collectivize and speak for themselves and acquire workers' rights like any other workers in the country. So I'm going to talk more about Darbar, which, is, which was his brainchild. And Darbar raises hope and aspiration among the marginalized community. So Darbar represents, as I mentioned, the sex workers. So who are the women who are in sex work? Most of these women belong to low socioeconomic and caste background. There is still a caste system in India, although it is getting better. Having very limited skill, they have very few choices in the labor market. However, they have shown strong determination to find a new livelihood option to improve the quality of life of, of themselves and their family. The, the, uh, most of them are migrants coming from rural part of India to the cities and also from other countries. So what are the possible choices open to these migrant women? In cities, they can be engaged either as domestic worker, cook, or cleaners. Some of them may find scope in construction work or may join in sex work. As you can see here, this is a human dishwasher. This is the cleaning job many of them do. So, these migrant women, sex workers, are the most vulnerable category of workers, not because they have no agency or capability, but the law that regulates sex worker absorbs rights of sex workers directly or indirectly. Sex trade, uh, trade structure and its functioning limits collectivization and enforcement of collective bargaining power of these workers. Stigma in discrimination um, attached to sex and sex work is another obstacle. Unwritten social policy prevent them to represent their issues and challenges in decision-making fora. And Dr. Jana stood up for these people. Just a little bit of uh, perspective. This is the map of India, and this is where West Bengal is, bordering with Bangladesh. The current population of, of India is nearly 1.4 billion. Population of West Bengal is over 91 million. And population of Kolkata, estimated, it says, is nearly 15 million. It says estimated because West Bengal has a very porous border with Bangladesh, so nobody knows how many people are actually in West Bengal at any one time. So this sex workers community really had a rebirth with uh, Dr. Jana's uh, DMSC formation. 
He understood the elements of determinants of health and pioneered the formation of GMSC, a sex workers organization which came into existence in 1995. Presently, GMSC represents voices of 60,000 sex workers, which include male, female, and transgenders in the state of West Bengal in India. And the organization is active in addressing underlying reasons for poverty, discrimination, and alienation from mainstream society. In other words, determinants of health. Now, what is unique in Sonagachi? Sonagachi is actually the red light district in Kolkata, and DMSC is based, their headquarters is based in here. The program at Sonagachi or DMSC conceptualized three simple principles, commonly called three R's. One is reliance, self-reliance, respect, self-respect and respect from others, and recognition that they actually exist. Now, DMSC has many, many um, functions, which I will touch on briefly in a few, few seconds. But the service component, currently they run 49 dedicated STI clinics in addition to condom programming and care and treatment of HIV positive women. The total sex workers covered under this intervention program is about 40,000 in addition to clients of sex workers because they are also part of certain programs. And total number of project staff is around 450 and 80% of them represent sex workers community. Being a victim of COVID-19 and ultimately an untimely passing away of Dr. Jana, thousands of sex workers collectively felt that they have lost their father. One of the um, prominent aspect of DMSC working is peer-led programs from the very beginning. The sex workers were trained in playing their role as health worker in the community, but they went beyond that. They started raising a number of issues pertaining to their life and occupation, which included police harass harassment, education for their children, and inability to access social and citizenship rights and identity. So this is much more than just health. Just a slide to show that since 1992, there has been a number of uh, uh, surveys, uh, zero surveys done. And you can see in this slide, the condom usage has gone really high over a very short period of time and being sustained for many, many years. And the HIV and syphilis, the VDRL is a marker for syphilis, is really remained and in a sustained way quite low in comparison to many other cities. And this, not only it was just India, the lessons learned from, learned from Sonagachi get articulated as two major strategies in the national program in India, namely creating enabling environment and community organizing and ownership building, which, which also are embraced by many donor agencies, including Bill and Melinda Gates, Ford Foundation, us, DFID here in the UK, and other UNA agencies, UNDP and UNAIDS. So this has been replicated in many, many parts of the world. From very early on, DMST felt, led by Dr. Jana, the importance of education. So non-formal education started in 1993. You can see that everybody has taken their footwear off before sitting in this place. And this is a very common practice in India and possibly many other countries. Now, in terms of economic vulnerability, they have formed their own cooperative society, which acts like a bank. It has got 30,000 members, and annual turnover is over 5 million US dollars. They, they have got a cultural wing, and whose name is Komul Gandhar, and they do many, many performances throughout the year in terms of drama, dance, street theater, etc., songs and music. They are extremely active and they perform really high quality. Amra Podatik 
the English version is we the foot soldier. This is more or less the political wing of the MST. They operate in 12 red light districts across West Bengal. They help accessing health, education, and career building opportunities. They, they fight social evils like drug addiction, child marriage, child labor, and gender-based violence, etc. They establish linkages with government and other institutions to enroll children of sex workers for various social entitlements. They help accessing birth certificates as identity proof and help raise co collective voices against stigma and discriminatory practices. Now, they have achieved many things. Some of the examples are here. 50 children after completing vocational training program is capable of maintaining their own livelihood, self-sufficient. Successfully prevented 12, 12 child marriages only in this year, and four of them has completed graduation. They have got a sport wing, which has many achievements within India and outside India, in Poland, in Denmark, and also in Indian national team under 40. They're very active on many, many fronts. Now, they have got a regulatory mechanism for they have got a board which has created a political space through constituting this board to curb trafficking, trafficking of women in sex trade, which is a very serious and emerging issue. And they had 33 events through which they have rescued and reintegrated more than uh, 11 and nearly 1100 minors and unwilling women who didn't want to go to the trade. And it shows that the average <clears throat> 1000 new entrants of sex work only below 2% and trafficked women is very little through their self-regulatory board activity. And the things have been improving all the time. And I mentioned about the education program. They run 37 educational center in 37 red light districts. Around this number of sex workers, over nearly 600 and nearly 1,500 children of them are enrolled under this non-formal education. They have got a residential place for children of sex workers, which accommodate 80 children. They offer vocational training to sex workers and children, around 100 participants per year. This is the residential home. 80 children are there, between five and 14. They are integrated into the general community in terms of local school, etc., and they are doing very well. A happy bunch of children. They've got a research and training institute, and Dr. Jana was the director of that. And they conduct research uh, nationally and internationally it, by collaboration. There are current collaboration with Manchester University as well, which uh, will be talked about later. They've conducted 20 research uh, researches till date, and many papers in peer um, reviewed journal. They also do capacity building. Lots of activities of DMSC and led by Dr. Jana. And these are the exposure of external world to their project. About 120 interns get placement in Sunagachi from various universities within India and outside. Exposure visits the policymakers and program managers, about 50 per year. So Dorbar, which is uh, BMSC, is championing the cause of other marginalized communities. This is beyond just Dorbar. Um, and their um, activity include children of natives in, in rural area in West Bengal. There are certain entertainment workers in certain part of West Bengal. They are helping them to get due recognition. Fishermen in West Bengal southern part, they are helping them. Basically, they are exporting DMSC's knowledge and transferable skills to other 
marginalized and suppressed community in India and West Bengal. So I will stop here and I hope I've given a flavor of what DMSC is now, which was founded by Dr. Jana and actively led throughout. And on behalf of the sex, sex workers and DMSC, I would like to say thank you for listening to this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandel, that, um, for that presentation. Um, and uh, in, in memory of uh, Dr. John, thank you. Very interesting. So now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Anna Waterson, to present, please. Hi, can you see that OK? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. So um, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a lecturer in healthcare sciences at the University of Manchester, um, and I've been involved in some of the projects with DMSC. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Dr. Mandel for agreeing to talk to us about the work of Dr. Jarnan today. Um, we were all very saddened to hear about his sudden death, um, but we're very grateful for this opportunity to speak about his work. Um, and to introduce DMSC more widely to our International Festival of Public Health audience. Um, so thank you for that, Deb. Um, I'm just going to speak very briefly about the projects that we've been doing with DMSC um, and how we plan to continue that relationship moving forward. So um, in January 2020, myself and my colleague Tracy were lucky enough to go to Calcutta um, and see the work of DMSC firsthand. Um, and we met Dr. Jana and he was very generous, gave us a lot of his time and a tour of the facilities and the communities. Um, and I feel very privileged to have had that experience. Um, and during this trip, um, we met the research team that Dr. Jana has spoken about. Um, and I think some of them are with us in the audience today. So that's great. Thank you for joining us. Um, we spoke about some of the projects that we might want to collaborate on. Um, and we had a plan to share some of the data from DMSC's existing projects around HIV prevention um, and at the same time develop some training tools to help build the research capacity in Sonagachi. Um, but then unfortunately very soon after that COVID-19 took hold um, and even back in May 2020 cases and deaths were rising quite rapidly in India and a national lockdown was in place. And this was also the case in West Bengal when DM, DMSC are based. Um, so the organization was drawing on its assets um, and what was already in place to provide information about COVID-19 to the community. Um, but in addition to the, the threat of coronavirus, um, the sex workers had also lost 100% of their income because they were unable to work. Um, so DMSC had started to distribute um, face masks and hand sanitizers, but they were reliant on charitable funds. And as the pandemic continued, it proved to be um, unsustainable. So we had a chat about what we might be able to do. Um, and we were fortunate to be able to access some funding from the University's um, Global Challenges Research Fund pot. Um, and the, Dr. Jana and the programme leaders at DMSC um, proposed engaging the sex workers in um, production and distribution of masks and hand sanitizers. Um, and this would be a program that had multiple benefits. So it would provide that source of PPE, um, but it would also provide an alternative source of income for the sex workers. And it could also provide a channel to um, continue to educate and raise awareness about coronavirus and how to prevent it. We added an evaluation element, so we wanted to co-produce an evaluation of the project as part of our research capacity building. But the first thing we did was to design a knowledge, attitudes and practices survey. Um, and we wanted to establish the impact that the virus had had on the community at that time. And um, I'm just briefly going to run through some of the initial results from that survey. Um, we developed um, a short survey based on some early COVID-19 related caps and a document from World Health Organization. We, um, we worked with DMSC to, to tailor that to the needs of the community. 
and then we asked their field researchers to go out and help us with the data collection. Um, so DMSC already have a team of trained field researchers working with the community around HIV. At this time, they were also distributing um, food parcels, so they were able to carry out the survey at the same time as these activities. Um, and between September and December 2020, they managed to collect over a thousand results. Um, and those results showed, um, we've just done a preliminary analysis, um, they showed a very good understanding of COVID-19 and how to prevent it, but it did also identify some barriers to implementing those prevention methods. So um, as you can see from this slide, there were concerns over availability and affordability of masks, um, similarly with soap and hand sanitizer and quite a large proportion of the community unable to access um, running water, so hand hygiene becomes very difficult. Um, a large proportion of the community felt that they wouldn't be able to self-isolate, whether that's because um, there were many people sharing small rooms or small houses, or because they were not able to, to deal with a lack of income from not going out to work. We did ask whether um, people have managed to maintain their income during the pandemic and overwhelmingly they hadn't. And you can see from this slide that people were struggling to provide for their basic needs such as rent, food and medicine. Um, and when we asked what people were most concerned about, um, obviously they were concerned about the health implications, but you can see fourth from the bottom there, um, also very concerned about loss of income or loss of job. So um, the initial fear that the economic impact of the lockdown could be devastating for the community was borne out by the survey. Um, and justified putting in place this program. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about what happened with the program. This was mainly carried out by DMSC on the ground in Kolkata. Um, but they quite quickly managed to remodel their space that um, Deb showed us before into a production area. They sourced... Um, sewing machines and the raw materials to make face masks um, in the first instance. They, they procured these from local suppliers. They researched regulations and they were given permission to manufacture to a standard that they would be able to market to local clinics. By the end of 2020, they were engaging in training quality control processes and were getting ready to go to market um, with these face masks. Um, with the initial market of the local community clinics, but then with the potential to expand further. Um, unfortunately, then, um, as you will have seen, a second wave of COVID-19 um, hit India and a lockdown was put back in place and movements were restricted. So research activities had to be paused. Um, the PPE project was put on hold um, and the team in Kolkata were focused on meeting the more immediate needs of distributing food aid. Um, COVID mitigation efforts did continue and um, I was told yesterday that the community secured vaccination priority status. So there's a vaccination program underway and, and many community members have now been vaccinated. So it is beginning to look like we might be able to think about some post COVID recovery initiatives. And um, even though the project has been paused, I think there are some things that we can already take away from this collaboration. Um, Cases of COVID in the community have been very low, both in the first and second waves. Um, and we think this is due to the existing community empowerment approach, that long-standing approach that makes DMSC a trusted source of information and gives it the ability to advocate for the needs of its members. Um, and this is something else that we gathered some information on in the CAP and that we'd like to look at more closely. Um, links were formed with local industry and there's an opportunity for further collaborations there. Um, the organisation showed its ability um, to be flexible and to, to adapt to the um, most pressing of needs and there's um, definitely things that we can build on there. Um, and as Deb mentioned, DMSC have been engaging in employment and training and education activities for many years. Um, and this may be another avenue that can be used for those activities as well. Um, and DMSC remain committed to continuing the research um, they've been doing as they learn to cope with the impact of COVID-19 um, and also as they adjust to the loss of Dr. Jana. Um, and uh, the university, we're also com committed to supporting this as much as we can. 
So some of the things that we have already spoken about um, includes continuing with these research capacity building activities. We, we hope that the project will restart, but if not, we have some existing data and we can work with the research team in Kolkata to analyze that together. Um, we might be able to look into the impact of um, further waves of COVID-19. Quite a lot has changed since that initial survey um, around this time last year. So we might be able to update some of that information. Um, it'd also be really interested to look into the role of community-based organizations in this empowerment approach as a public health response to COVID-19 and to use DMSC as an example of where that's been done very well with a marginalized community. Um, and then looking at what, what we can do to support the community recovery post COVID. And I'm looking forward to that continuing relationship. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Um, really, again, uh, another really interesting and excellent presentation and uh, highlighting uh, those important research activities with community organisations and highlighting um, future opportunities as well in this uh, important public health response to COVID. Thank you, Hannah. So um, I'd like to invite our next speakers, Dr. O Obo and sorry, Dr. Nosa and Obo, uh, to present. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'd like to say a big thank you to, to Professor Apana for the opportunity to uh, work with Precious Gems. Um, it's been an exciting relationship for the past um, one year plus now. And we in Precious Gems, we, we, are, we are very grateful for this um, partnership. Um, we want to present what, you know, the, the story of what went on in Nigeria. And I would like to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Nusa, who will be able to do the talking. So thanks so much. Um, you are mute, Dr. Nusa, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Nice meeting you. Good morning from Nigeria. I'm Dr. Nusa Afede. I'm the head of the Department of the Public Health public health uh, in the um, Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital. So the title of my presentation is COVID-19 Response, the Nigerian Experience. My co-presenters are Dr. Obo Kyoyame, Joy Oyebujo, and Yemiya Obetere. The first case of COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa was reported in Nigeria on the 27th of February last year. As at 21st July this year, there are 169884 confirmed cases, 2,128 deaths, and 206 new cases recorded in 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Nigeria is the eighth highest ranked African country concerning registered cases registered confirmed cases of COVID-19. Lagos State was initially the epicenter of the outbreak. Then Kanu and the Federal Capital Territory Abuja joined Lagos as high burden states, contributing 64.5% of the cumulated total cases in Nigeria by the end of, the, of May last year. The Nigerian government at the discovery of the index case restricted international travel on 15 high incidence countries, namely China, Italy, Iran, Norway, South Korea, Spain, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, and Austria. As at February 14th, about 55 different lineages of SARS-CoV-2 have been discovered circulating in Nigeria, and they are rapidly changing as we speak. We also discovered two variants November last year, the B117 variant and the B1525 variant. Results of seroprevalence studies conducted in four states in Nigeria, Lagos, Enugu, Gombe, and Nasarawa. Lagos and Enugu are in the south south of the country, while Gombe and Nasarawa are in the northern part of Nigeria. Between September and October last year, revealed that the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies 
was 23% in both Lagos and Enugu states, 19% in Nasarawa state, and 9% in Gombe state. This study was conducted by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control last year. Higher rates of infection were seen, were seen in males in the country compared to females and in urban areas compared to rural uh, settings, and in persons aged 18 to 64 years. This is um, a picture depicting the number of confirmed cases, discharge cases, deaths, and samples. This is a weekly presentation report as at 30th May of this year on COVID-19. Also age gender breakdown of cases in Nigeria, cases and deaths in Nigeria from week 10 last year to May this year. Nigeria's multi-sectorial response was coordinated by the presidential task force set up by the federal government on COVID-19 with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control Agency partnering with the federal government. Isolation and treatment centers were established for the management of COVID-19 cases across the country. There were training of health workers on case management, infection prevention and control practices, surveillance, risk communication, and other areas of epidemic preparedness and response nationwide. The NCDC supplied medical equipment as a personal protective equipment to the 36 states of the country, developed preparedness guidelines, and instituted non-pharmaceutical measures such as hand washing, use of face masks and physical distancing. And are, of course, at the same time, all these measures are applicable globally. This is a picture showing the, the preventive measures that were instituted in the country. And I'm sure this is what also happened all over the world. The pandemic provided the opportunity to rapidly scale up Nigeria's public health infrastructure. Our public health infrastructure is rather poor. So the government uses it as an opportunity to improve the public health infrastructure nationwide. Notable is the establishment of more than 70 public health laboratories across the country from last year to date. Presently, we have at least one public health laboratory in the 36 states of the country. As part of measures to contain the spread of the disease, beginning in March 2020, there was an initial closure of the nation's borders. Lockdowns were imposed and interstate travels banned nationwide. Schools, uh, tertiary, secondary, primary schools were closed down completely. Offices and services considered non-essentials were also closed. Because of the complaints of the citizens, our citizens, because of the disruptions caused by this lockdown, they yeah, agreed. And there were several complaints from several quarters. Actually, people even came out to protest, in the protest everywhere. So it had to be followed by a gradual ease of lockdown in phases to ensure a balance between preserving lives and livelihoods, while at the same time addressing the social economic disruptions caused by the COVID-19 outbreak. In March 2021, this year, Nigeria received nearly 4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines shipped via the COVAX facility. This is a partnership between the CEPI, Gavi, UNICEF, and uh, World Health Organization. And as at, the, as at 12th of July this year, 3.94 million doses, not much anyway, 3.94 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. So we also administered in my hospital, yes. And then with um, 1.4 million persons fully vaccinated, having received two doses. So that amounts to 1% of the population vaccinated. In the light of the rising trend in several countries, the phase four of the ease lockdown was effective from the 11th of May this year. We also had confirmed cases of Delta variant detected in Nigeria as of July 8th this year. In Edo State, as my state where I presently live and work, the government scaled up screening and testing, uh, testing followed by prompt management, isolation and treatment as applicable in the health institutions in the states, across the states. 
at the Ural Specialist Teaching Hospital, my organization, there's a nationally approved isolation and fitness center. It was formerly for um, NASA FIFA, but it was now adapted for COVID-19, for the management, and, uh, management of cases of COVID-19. The institution also deployed skilled manpower to several states, including the Federal Capital Territory of Abuja, as a contribution to the national response to the pandemic. Our lab scientists and doctors have been trained. Our lab scientists and doctors have been trained internationally in several countries in Germany, in Harvard, uh, in uh, um, trained as in globally, yes, on especially on molecular diagnosis and on infection uh, on um, um, in, uh, IPC infection prevention and control practices. So we were at an advantage. So we had to go all out to the states. We had to go to the states. We were deployed to several states in the country to help build their um, uh, health structure, health systems. Statistics from ERA Specialist Teaching Hospital also shows that at that last year, from February when we had the first case till December last year, we had a total number of um, uh, total number of tested COVID-19 cases tested were 9,502. It's the positives, total positives last year, 1,813. The male positives, 1,027. Female positives, 786 from our center. Now, these samples were received from this south, not just only at those states, from other states, southern states in the nation. And from January 2021 to date, to present, because I, I got this information from my institution, total number of patients, uh, of patients tested at now this year, 3,687, positive 723, males positive 318, and female positive 343. Testing is still ongoing. I was personally involved in the res, uh, response to COVID-19 in Edo State, in my capacity as the representative of Precious James Post and the head of epidemiological unit, public health department, Ira Specialist Teaching Hospital. Uh, but I was appointed as the head of public health, Ira Specialist Teaching Hospital, December last year. In community sensitization, we carried out community sensitization and, and education across communities in the state carried out several advocacy visits to the monarchs as the kings, the community elders and key stakeholders. Did contact tracing of uh, patients admitted in Euro Specialist Teaching Hospital, contact tracing of their relatives in their homes, visited homes, did carry that contact tracing, both in the hospital and in the community. I was also the lead physician in the Edo State team for the assessment and selection of health facilities. We assessed and selected health facilities in the different local governments in uh, Edo State for adaptability, for screening, as screening, as used for screening centers and uh, um, the, the first referral centers uh, where the patients get to before they are now moved to the management uh, treatment centers. So we did, we actually assessed health facilities available and we selected from these health facilities the um, um, health facilities that can be used for screening and um, initial management of patients before they are transferred to the tertiary hospital in the South West and the South Central local government areas of the state. I found this experience interesting, enlightening, and rewarding. Now, Precious James in December last year did a collaborative, a collaborative study with the University of Manchester around knowledge, attitudes, and practices towards COVID-19 in rural communities in the two states, Nigeria. In assessing these communities, we have to do community entry. We, end, we, and, uh, we did stakeholders engagement. We engaged the traditional rulers, and traditional chiefs, and the elders of the community. This is the traditional communication channels. So we engage the kings, the monarchs, we call them onojis, the traditional chiefs, the Ojong Wiles, or the elders of the community and the community of elders before we could penetrate into the community. And then these traditional elders or stakeholders pass the information 
in their in their respective dialects with the town criers. The town criers goes from homes to house to house in each of these communities and relay the information to the uh, the citizens. This um, Dr. Greg will go into details on uh, the work the work we did, but um, I will just say here that we we assessed 14 communities and uh, we assessed communities 14 communities for the survey. We had about um, 649 participants in the study. So this is just the age range of the uh, participants that were involved in the study. Dr. Greg will go into details. Now there are some pictures. These are pictures of um, the engagement process we did. These are the they were the you, you just saw the um, stakeholders, the elders. These are my team members reaching out to the community elders and informing them of what we wanted to do in the community. So these are the processes we went through to enter the community. These are some of the pictures of the activities we did. And in administering questionnaires, there are also few selected pictures. You see, they are administering here, our team members administering um, questionnaires. In order to assess the community, we also had to do a medical outreach because we couldn't get the people to come out because we had to assemble them in town halls. So for us to attract them, we did medical outreach as well as the administrative questionnaires. So this is the process. Yeah, carried out in 14 town halls in 14 different communities. So these are some of the demonstrations we did when we were passing out information on COVID-19, because we also had to tell them about COVID-19, demonstrating how to um, how to wash hands and, and then demonstrations on other preventive measures. So what were our personal observations during our collaborative work with Manchester? We observed, we, are, we made our own observation because we went down to the grassroots, we went to the community. Remember, information coming from the government is actually where it's really going through to the community. The community members were not feeling the impacts of the instituted uh, or stipulated uh, measures being put in place by the government. So we, in, in carrying out this study, we observed some things. And this way, like, we observed that there was a disconnect of information on risk communication from government institutions like the um, Nigeria Center for Disease Control that I mentioned before on the instituted COVID-19 measures to down to rural settlements. The information was not getting to the populace at the grassroots. And so they were unaware of what was really going on. So COVID-19 rules and guidelines were not really applicable in the rural communities that we entered our observation. So our intervention, this community survey we did, helped bridge this process. And this was acknowledged and appreciated by the participants of the survey. Communities we entered also lacked the necessary materials for, this, uh, for prevention. Uh, they lacked hand wash stations. Uh, several communities where I stay, we don't have water, five bomb water. So we have make use of wells, so water is scarce. So what we do is that we set up, there's this um, um, hand wash station set up with receptacles and you put water in for washing of hands. And then, so we observed that the community lacked these things, the hand wash stations, the face mask, hand sanitizer. Precious James also made some provisions in that aspect. There were interventions in the communities. We also observed that the protocols instituted by the government and government agencies were not culturally or environmentally appropriate. So thus we are not adaptable in rural settings, in rural communities. So this hindered compliance to uh, preventive measures to COVID-19 in rural settings. And regarding the issue of corruption, the supplies were actually provided by the government, relief materials, foods, um, and materials for preventive measures, but these materials did not reach the public. Now, what happened? These supplies and relief materials were hoarded in warehouses in states across the country by corrupt officials. At the time, the citizens, like I mentioned before, that have been aggrieved, that were angry, upset about the disruptions. It's not really, remember in Nigeria, we have people are actually struggling to survive. So adding these measures, lockdown measures, and it prevented them from assessing their workplace, from earning uh, salaries, from even, so 
they were people were actually suffering. And then they got to know that there were palliatives set up by the government and the palliatives were not reached, reaching the citizens in all the states. The citizens now got to know where these materials were hoarded, where they were kept. They broke into the warehouses that was last year and helped themselves. This event happened simultaneously in almost all the states of the Federation. So we have pictures here, pictures of Nigerians helping themselves with COVID-19 relief materials ordered by government officials in warehouses. This happened in Edo State, in Benin City, actually. They broke into the warehouse in Benin. This, this one happened in Abuja, Badwala in Abuja, where they located a, a warehouse and broke into it and helped themselves with the relief materials. So all board will continue from here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Dr. Nosa. So from another thing that I wanted to add to, to read in terms of what we also did. So apart from providing the Veronica buckets, because they call the Veronica buckets, we also uh, supported because we knew that because of the lockdown and all that, so many people were not really getting some jobs. So we were able to engage women who could sew. So, and they, you know, using the standard for face masks, so they were engaged economically to be able to make their make face masks. So this face mask was that we did. So every community we went to, we also provided them with face masks. We, we also provided them too, because another thing that Dr. Nusa mentioned was one of the carrots that we use in mobilizing the community was we went through the strategy of organizing um, um, outreaches with health free health outreaches. So with that one, we, we were able to, you know, attend to them and they, they came to us with all sort of uh, complaints that they had. So we had doctors in place who were able to treat the members of the community. So two things came out from there. So apart from raising the awareness of COVID and, uh, and giving them education, we also found out some other things that were prevalent within the community in terms of disease-wise. So there were multiple things that was going on uh, at the same time. So one thing I want to say is that I'm really grateful for the opportunity that we have to collaborate with the University of Manchester in, in order to do this. And we look forward to more collaborations because the process is not ended yet, you know, because the community still, you know, wants more assistance. Though we have done the initial knowledge, attitude and practice, but there are so many questions that have been raised already, you know, through this process. And I believe that with the continuous relationship we have, we should be able to do more impact. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Nose and Oba uh, for a really interesting um, presentation. And uh, particularly, thank you as well for um, all your help in the response. Um, with regard to COVID, really appreciate all your efforts and your partnership work with Precious Gems. And uh, really interesting to hear about that um, engagement with citizens and the approaches that you need. So thank you both. So uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Greg, Greg Williams, to present. Hi, thanks, Ange. Um, so yeah, I'm Greg Williams. I'm a lecturer in public health at the University of Manchester. So I'm just going to briefly um, go a bit further in terms of what Dr. Nosa was talking about with regards to our projects, looking at uh, knowledge, attitudes and practices um, in Edo State. Um, so briefly, some of this is you, you heard from Dr. Nosa. So Edo State is in the uh, southern region of Nigeria. It has a population of approximately 5 million people, GDP per capita just over three and a half thousand dollars. Uh, you saw the cases and deaths for Nigeria in Dr. Nose's presentation. These are all taken from yesterday um, for Nigeria and Edo State. So just to also put a bit of context, um, Dr. Nose mentioned, in fact, she showed that picture that's from the BBC News about the um, hoarding and the looters. So some further context. So obviously we see the figures look a lot lower um, for COVID compared to the UK, for example. But obviously there are other issues going on um, that we need to take into consideration with regards to it. So, for example, we all saw at the start of the pandemic, the oil um, prices going down into minuses, in fact. And Nigeria, that oil revenue is the main revenue for the Nigerian government. We also saw that a decline in remittance payments. So remittance payments are when uh, a person would leave to move to another country um, for work and send the payment back home. 
Um, but that decline with things like the furlough schemes and job losses of the pandemic meant that that wasn't allowed to be, wasn't able to be passed over. So that also is another factor that um, causes problems. And also before the pandemic, four in 10 people um, in Nigeria were below the poverty line and it has the highest rate of extreme poverty globally. And I know yesterday from a presentation I saw um, about Nigeria that um, they mentioned that there were over 90% of children in Nigeria live in poverty. So these obviously all are difficult situations within the pandemic. Um, so just a brief introduction to Precious Gems Africa, obviously Obo and Dr Nosa introduced them. So they're a UK and African based charity uh, with a focus on health and wellbeing support, particularly amongst women and girls. And we also worked with Dr Nosa's organisation, Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital uh, for this project. So we, we did some train of community workers. The initial idea at the start was to do it via webinars. So we'd create the training package in, at the University of Man Manchester, but this proved difficult with the um, connectivity issues. So um, what we did was we created an online um, platform through Rise Articulate, which was led by Anjana, who's um, the chair of this session. And it included things like the epidemiology of COVID, uh, infection prevention and control strategies, but also what we did was we tailored it specifically to the uh, guidance from the Nigerian Centre for Disease Control um, to make it locally relevant. And also we had input from Dr Nosa and her team to ensure that there was that local relevance. So from there, there were 32 trainees and they ranged from um, administrators to medical doctors from every specialist teaching hospital and all also Ambrose Alley University. We also conducted uh, CAP questionnaires with them before the training session and after the training session. I, I use a royal we there, we didn't in Manchester, uh, that was our colleagues in Nigeria. Um, we did feedback for the training and it got 4.6 out of 5 score for effectively reaching the intended learning objectives. Um, so these are some preliminary findings from the, what Dr Nosa was describing when they went out into the communities um, and took this cross-sectional survey. Um, we've not fully analysed it and we're hoping to get a few papers out because when we developed the questionnaire um, with uh, Dr Nosa and her team, they, we took them from some WHO questionnaires, um, a CAP survey from Wuhan and also one from Kenya and it's actually a very large one so there's a lot of data there that we need to go through. It was perhaps a bit too large um, but they, the team out there worked really hard to um, get the questionnaires um, completed. So as you can see some of the challenges we've been finding, so in our average household size is 4.4 which ranges from 1 to 25 people inside the house so obviously that has implications for transmission and self-isolation and 19.9 percent felt they had no risk of being infected with COVID-19. There was 78.6 percent had worn a mask in the last week but also 73.6 have been to a crowded place. As you can see quite low 28.4 percent only only felt that the household was currently doing something to prevent COVID and even lower 23.2 percent felt the community was and also quite importantly nearly half of those surveyed wouldn't have a spare room if they did need to self-isolate and um, even lower thought that they um, community members would be able to self-isolate. Um, looking at in a bit more depth on some of these so these are more of the attitudes so this is looking at who they thought could hand, had high confidence, sorry, that could handle the COVID-19 situation well. Or the higher up ones are obviously the hospitals, Ministry of Health. Um, it's still only 60 odd percent, but it's really low figures for the likes of the police with just over 10% and schools at around 15%. Um, looking at the types of information they, they felt that they needed, it was, very much loaded towards the protecting the family, the symptoms, as opposed to um, more of the um, the actual uh, worldwide pandemic and information about the science and the authorities' decisions. And just one final slide from looking at it, we have briefly looked, it may not be too surprising, we looked at where people had completed secondary education versus not completed secondary education. And as you can see, particularly for the knowledge and practices, it's quite, um, there's quite a lot more are likely to, if they've completed sec 
secondary education have the knowledge and actively be practicing and the attitudes we've found though are quite similar again though that we've got quite a lot of future work to do with this and um analysis and there's a lot of um as i said a lot of questions for us to look into and um, so finally i just want to say as one point so this is just uh, we got this part of money from the global challenges research from qr funding and um, that was great it was a quite a small pop considering the gcrf funding but what it does it has allowed is just to reiterate that it goes beyond this project and um, we now as obo has been mentioning uh, developing a relationship there and currently um it's led to dr yonette thomas who we've a colleague of ours for many years she uh, used to be the chief executive of the international society of urban health in new york and is currently uh, the chief executive of urban health 360 and now as a result of us linking up with uh, our colleagues in nigeria um Yannette is now delivering a leadership training mentorship scheme uh, which she currently has 18 students for that are uh, medical students um in nigeria and in edo state um and they have been helping us. They presented at the European Public Health Week we put on with the European uh, Public Health Association. And you might have seen throughout this um, festival, they all have been presenting their photo stories in different sessions. And um, so it's leading to building this and um, basically just saying that these these small pots of money can lead to big changes. And hopefully this, these 18 students will go on and it will uh, deliver further. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Aparna Verma to close the session. Hi, thank you, Ange. And um, I wanted to close the session because of how moved I've always been uh, since Deb uh, walked into my office um, a few years ago now. Um, and told us first about Dr. Jana um, all those years ago. Um, I think we've been overwhelmed by um, the inspirational leadership, uh, the way that he was able to become such a leading figure, uh, not just professionally, but personally um, in India and um, being able to work with him for the shortest amount of time now. We always think I, uh, that we have infinite amounts of time. And I think the passing of Dr. Jana really emphasized that time is quite limited and um, we can learn from the huge contribution that he's made not just in India, but I'm thinking of all those people um, that he's worked with internationally, whose careers have really been influenced by his teaching, by his mentorship, and by the way that he's allowed us to come and, um, uh, come and look at all the fabulous work he's been leading on um, in Kolkata. Um, so I wanted to say a personal thanks and a huge thanks to Deb, who um, first allowed us this opportunity. And uh, we hope that in the future uh, that this will continue to be a relationship uh, that um, we will foster and bid for other grants. Um, then I'd like to thank Obo and Dr. Mosa. Um, we've been um, really inspired by the fantastic work that you've done. Um, and I think going forward, there's a lot of opportunities that we really need to maximise working with um, Deb and uh, the team um, in India and thinking about how we can um, further formalise our relationship. Um, I think Greg said um, there's lots for us to do with what we've done already, um, but I think um, we've got a lot to do 
any way going forward. Uh, so I'd like to thank the speakers. Um, the, the amount of work is phenomenal. And I, I see lots of different uh, social responsibility activities uh, where things are sort of given to populations. I think what's so special about the work that you've done here is the capacity building and the way that um, through some of our links that we really are building some of those strong relationships that are going to be enduring. Um, so I hope um, that we are able to continue this journey together and I'd just like to hand back to Ange um, and thank uh, everybody for their participation, remind people um, that uh, the Daily Digest will look at um, uh, summarising our sessions and also um, just to have a look at the programme as we have the last day of events still to come. Thank you, Ange. Thank you, Aparna, um, for um, an excellent closing to an excellent session. Um, thank you, Dr. Mandel, for those moving words at the beginning, the uh, really inspiring presentation. Thank you, Hannah, uh, for highlighting the excellent research that you do in collaboration with other partners. Thank you, Dr. Nosa and Opo, for your excellent work and in response to this um, unprecedented pandemic and for those efforts. Um, and thank you, Greg, for again highlighting the collaborative research that you've been doing as well. And uh, so thank you, everyone, for, your, uh, for joining us and um, for this excellent session. And uh, if you're on Twitter, please uh, follow us on uh, the hash using hashtag PHFest2021. And uh, I've just popped the links in for our uh, for, uh, plenary sessions today. There's uh, two plenaries and uh, the links, uh, the Zoom links are there. Uh, otherwise, it's also you streamed on YouTube. So I hope you can join us. Thank you very much for your time and I um, hope you've enjoyed the festival so far. Um, still, there's, don't worry, there's still two more sessions to go, so uh, it's not over yet. But thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.